Hi everyone, if you can uh, sit down, we're going to get going in about one minute. One minute warning. Thank you. I said I'll give you a minute, so I'm really giving you a minute. It's <laughs> about 15 seconds to go. It's also so quiet in here. I don't know what I've done to you, but this never happens in any of my classrooms. Um, okay, so... Eric Colvin is nearly sitting down, so we're nearly ready to go. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Emily Bell. I'm the director here at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia. Um, we are in the Brown Institute for Media Innovation, uh, this beautiful space here, uh, run by my um, co uh, conspirator, Mark Hansen, who's director here. So thank you very much indeed to the Brown Institute to, for letting us use this space. Um, and thank you very much indeed for coming out on a Monday morning, which, again, is a rare... Um, it's a, it's, it's a, I can tell you from running many events over many years here, this is an unbelievable turnout for a Monday morning. Um, but I'm not surprised you're here, uh, because the Reuters Institute Digital News Report um, is an absolute... Uh, it's a red-letter day uh, every, every year when it comes out, um, and we all pour over... Uh, the many, 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 many pages this year. Um, so I want to congratulate uh, Rasmus and Nick Newman and the team uh, at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in Oxford, who are um, a fabulous research team who produce uh, this global look at um, global news cons consumption, digital news consumption every year. Uh, and it would certainly not be possible if it wasn't for the beneficence of the um, uh, Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is an organization that does really great work. Uh, we often sort of, you know, I think people assume perhaps the Reuters Institute uh, is, you know, somehow a commercially funded body. It's not the Thomson Reuters Foundation, um, it's a charitable foundation. Um, and we're really delighted um, that they support this kind of work and they support a research centre of the calibre of the Reuters Institute. Um, in a minute, uh, we will kick things off um, with Rasmus walking us through the main findings and I will be uh, leading in dis a discussion and we want you to be um, very active participants in that. But first, I'm going to um, hand over to the Thomson Reuters Foundation Chief Executive, Antonio Zapula, he says that that's exactly how he pronounces his name, so that's good, um, who's going to say a few words of in introduction. Thanks very much, into Antonio. I got this, I think. Yeah, I Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here at Columbia for the New York launch of uh, the Digital News Report. And it's really great to be in the company of the next generation of uh, world-class journalists. There has never been a greater need for brilliant people to join the profession, people who are really ready to meet the immense challenges the media industry is encountering. For three decades, the Thomson Reuters Foundation has been deeply involved in strengthening the ecosystem for free media around the world, promoting journalism excellence. We do this because we believe independent and impartial journalism is the cornerstone of any functioning democracy. The importance of independent, trusted, accurate and fair reporting has never been greater. Think about it. We need good journalism when freedoms all over the world are being eroded. We need trusted journalism when governments try to tell people what's news and what isn't. We need fair journalism when anyone with an opinion can create, disseminate news 
and when breaking news and fake news are consumed in equal measure and without distinction. But we also need to be equally pragmatic. And we need to understand that like every other industry, the business models of media are being disrupted. They are changing in order to meet the ever-changing needs of consumers. And that is why the Digital News Report by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University is so important. Launched in 2012, the report has become the industry guide to benchmark digital trends. It's an invaluable resource, not just for journalists and publishers, but really for anyone with an interest in protecting and promoting free, accurate, and impartial journalism from policymakers to consumers themselves. By understanding how people around the world access news, we are better equipped to navigate the challenges of an industry which is becoming digital first. As information is shared faster, consumed faster, and understood and trusted less, we need to be better equipped to mitigate the spread of sensational stories or false news on anything from politics to terrorism to national disasters. Viral hoaxes, manipulated images, or even deep fake, for example, are now being shared at such speed that their power to escalate unstable political situations, spark mass protest, and even lead to violence is increasingly high. You only have to look at the spread of this information on WhatsApp in Brazil, or more recently at the riots in Jakarta last month following the Indonesian presidential election and the government's lockdown on social media platforms. Power has truly become digital. As the charitable arm of the world's biggest news and information provider, the Thomson Reuters Foundation supports free media and its ecosystem. To this day, we have trained more than 18,000 reporters around the world in nine languages on anything ranging from digital security to business sustainability to countering misinformation around elections. We have also provided free legal assistance and powerful legal research to NGOs working to protect free speech, from Reporters Without Borders to the Commission to Protect Journalists. Additionally, our team of 60 reporters covers everyday human rights stories, shining a light on issues ranging from climate change to LGBT plus rights to modern day slavery. We do so because such news is also worth covering and worth sharing. This year, the issue of protecting free media will be the focus of our annual Human Rights Conference, the Trust Conference, held on November 14th in London. We'll be taking a look at the powerful intersection between technology and human rights, and hearing not only from journalists who have paid the price for free speech, but also from big tech companies on the subjects of privacy, of fake news, and elections meddling. In nations with authoritarian governments, we know that the ability to disseminate this information or silence the media is a rising threat. And we see this really coinciding with the rise of far-right far nationalist movements from the Philippines to Russia and across Europe, particularly in Slovenia, but also in the Czech Republic and in Serbia. A free press has always been a threat to those seeking to quash democracy. But the ways in which oppression is now taking place are radically changing, from discrediting creditable media in the US to the government's shutdown of free press in Turkey. Just last week, the arrest of journalist Ivan Gulunov, an investigative reporter looking at large-scale crime and corruption in Moscow, was the latest blow for free press, for free press in Russia. But the mass protest in response by Russian media outlets, but also by the wider public, really led to charges being dropped. So once again, Power is digital. When free media thrives, society thrives too. And now, like never before, there is a growing demand for groundbreaking, investigative, world-class journalism that cuts through the chaos and that holds authorities to account. One that exposes corruption and keeps politicians and public officials in check. Because free media not only informs, it also empowers and it also drives change. Protecting free speech and fostering the highest standards of journalism all over the world is dependent on making sense of the ongoing revolution transforming the media landscape today. In a digital world where social media has become the main source of news, how does a fluid and global audience dictate editorial direction? Which platforms are being used the most to discuss and to share news? And where? And what does it even mean to trust your news source? 
has Facebook reputation taking an irreversible nosedive. We will leave in a world, in a post-truth world. We are about to hear some of these answers. The Thomson Reuters Foundation is proud to support a world-leading institution with the same global outlook as ours, exploring and examining the media industry. And so by continuing to drive the conversation around the future of news, our goals are aligned to strengthen and to protect the future of journalism for a world that depends upon it. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Rasmus Nielsen, who's the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Rasmus. Thanks very much for the kind introduction, Antonio, and to Emily and the team here at Tau for the opportunity to be back here and talk about the 2019 Reuters Institute Digital News Report. Um, the mission of the Reuters Institute is to explore the future of journalism worldwide. Um, one of the premises of our work is the idea that journalism exists in the context of its audience, that the public value of what journalists do is relying on that connection uh, with the public, that the political and social impact and importance of journalism is premised on that connection and that the sustainability of journalism as a profession and, and the news industry as an industry is premised in part on that connection with the audience. And what we want to do in the Digital News Report every year is to try to provide an independent, evidence-based, international look at how news and media use is changing around the world, how people think about uh, news and media, what are the similarities uh, in, in the big global developments? What are the differences between different countries and different organizations? And what does it mean uh, for a news industry and a journalistic profession that's navigating a period of both great challenges and great opportunities? Um, we also try to do it in a way that I think sort of builds on some of the best innovations we've seen in journalism in the last 20 years or so, in the sense that we don't operate in the model of sort of, you know, we publish and you read. So we do an awful lot of work in sort of the 10 months or so before the publication of this report. But then the moment it comes out is when a new phase of this work begins, the phase of a conversation where we travel the world to try to meet with journalists, with media organizations, with technology companies, with policymakers to talk about what it means for them, to talk about what it means for you, to talk about how the situational awareness we can provide can be translated into actionable insights for individual organizations or individual journalists. So in the spirit of that conversation today, uh, what I will do is to uh, highlight just a few key findings as I see it from uh, this year's report, but also then uh, tee up a conversation that Emily has kindly agreed to moderate where a number of distinguished practitioners from different perspectives will talk about what this work and other uh, insights means for their work and for their organization. So I'm very glad that we have uh, Katia here from Yahoo News, uh, we have Latoya here from Google News, Initi News Initiative, Marcus from CNN and Francesco from the Wall Street Journal to talk about the different ways in which their organizations are moving towards the future of journalism in part on the basis of their understanding of how audience behavior is changing. So, the Digital News Report 2019. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the project will know uh, that this is the world's uh, biggest ongoing publicly available uh, survey of news and media use. This year we cover 38 markets across the world. We're very proud to have been able to add South Africa as our first presence in the African continent with support from the Open Society Foundations. Uh, the wider project is made uh, possible by a range of different sponsors that include technology companies like Google, media organizations like the BBC, media regulators from a number of different European countries, foundations, university partners, and others, uh, industry associations who care about the future of journalism. Methodologically, I should just preface what I'm about to say about the key findings, that the bulk of the research I present today is based on an online survey of news users uh, in countries with near universal internet penetration. This is basically the whole population but some of the countries and markets that we cover are countries that are characterized by poverty, deep inequality, and lack of access, lack of access for large parts of the population. So I should stress here that the numbers do not always reflect the total population in particular countries like South Africa, Brazil, uh, or, or uh, other uh, countries with limited, still limited connectivity. Uh, in addition to the online survey, we do in-depth qualitative research, and I will share just a few quotes for in-depth interviews that we've done with news users in different countries to provide a bit of the lived experience of some of the developments that we track through the survey research. So really the key findings I want to sort of flag uh, just as a kickoff for our conversation uh, here today and a conversation I hope will continue online and in person well beyond uh, this room uh, are these. First, um, 
It's clear that we live in a time in which uh, the advertising incomes that funded much of professional journalism for much of the 20th century, uh, that advertising is increasingly going to very large, very profitable, very powerful, and very successful technology companies like Google and Facebook, leaving the news industry in a, a very uh, under immense pressure in terms of thinking about what a sustainable business model looks like. And more and more news organizations are thinking about some form of radio revenue or pay model as part of their response to that more challenging commercial environment. What we find in the surveys is, uh, is that more people are paying for online news, but the growth is incremental in most markets, uh, basically flat, and the majority of the subscriptions go to a limited number of sort of uh, uh, dominant, big, international and nationally oriented brands. Secondly, uh, concerns over misinformation uh, lead an increasing number of people to report that they are relying more on what they consider to be reputable brands and also sharing less and reading less from brands they consider to be less accurate. But the backdrop of this development is one in which we need to recognize that overall trust in news continues to fall in many countries around the world, and that uh, people have a much wider set of concerns about the value and quality of much of the journalism that they come across. This is not only about often limited trust, but also about complaints about, for example, a sense of overload, and a sense that the news is predominantly very negative and is a very sort of pessimistic framing of developments in the world. Fourth, uh, the role of platforms continue to evolve. Uh, our respondents say that they are spending less time on Facebook, but more time on other platforms, including Instagram and WhatsApp, but also, for example, YouTube. And finally, uh, we see other parts of the platform ecology developing too. Voice uh, is growing in importance, in part driven by smart speakers, but also voice assistants on phones. And podcasts in particular seems to be striking a chord, with, uh, especially with younger news consumers. So these are the main themes I'll dive into now. For those who are interested in it, we make all the research and all the data available. So check out the Digital News Report website, look at the slide deck, uh, look at the main report itself uh, for, for particular interest, whether by country or uh, area. Uh, or topic that you're interested in. But to start with the money, I suppose in that way I'm a typical academic, I'm obsessed uh, with money. <coughs> the, um, the development we are seeing around the world is one which there right now is, uh, is a clear proof of concept that there is a significant minority of people who are willing to pay for digital news. In the US, 16% of our respondents claim that they have in some form paid for digital news in the last year. This is not only subscriptions, but this is the larger universe of people who report to have paid in some way. There are significant country differences here, however. So for example, in the UK, where we are based, just 9% of respondents say that they have paid for news in the last year. Whereas in other parts of the world, like the Nordic countries, there's a much larger number of people who say that they are paying for news. Uh, as is, I suppose, often the case uh, in issues of digital journalism. Norway is leading the charge here with 34% uh, of respondents saying that they are, have paid in some way for news in the last year. Um, these numbers, of course, are significantly higher than zero, which I think was the number that not so long ago many people predicted uh, would be the number of people willing to pay for digital news. But it is worth recognizing that in many countries that we look at, the broad development is fairly flat in the years that we have been um, tracking self-reported uh, pay behavior. It is primarily in the US and a limited number of European countries that there's been an uptick in the number of people who say that they are paying for digital news. When we look at who is benefiting from this development, um, it's uh, industry, self-reported industry data suggests that the majority of these subscriptions are going to a limited number of dominant upmarket uh, international titles. So in the US, for example, um, the data released and collected by the Industry Association, FIPS, suggests, for example, that the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post account for a very large share of the overall number of digital news subscriptions. It's also worth recognizing that while, of course, these publications are different in many ways and different from the various local and regional news providers and others trying to get into the subscription and membership market, that largely, at least our survey data suggests, that they are competing for the loyalty, attention, and potentially consumer spend of a limited minority of the population that overwhelmingly is uh, highly educated, richer, and much more interested in news than the average news consumers. That this is a small, uh, sizable, but small minority of the population, and it's largely the same universe that most of the subscription-based businesses by now are fishing for subscribers in. 
The move to subscriptions, uh, of course, generated new revenue opportunities, and we were very pleased to see this. Uh, I think I said that there is proof of concept that this will work for some titles, though not clearly not for all. But it's also clear it introduces new forms, uh, uh, new, new challenges, if you will, in terms of a competitive environment in which our survey data suggests at this stage that uh, about half of everyone in the U.S. who says that they paid in some way for a subscription to news in the last year pay only for one subscription. So the question here is opposed is whether this is a winner takes most market where a few titles like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post may end up dominating subscription behavior across a continent sized market and local titles and others may struggle to get in to be that second subscription uh, and for a few news lovers a third or fourth subscription but these are very small numbers. The move to subscriptions is also introducing new friction in the user experience. Um, uh, where we see by now in a country like Norway, 70% of our respondents uh, report that they are hit a paywall uh, uh, in the last week while consuming uh, online news. And in this country, 50% saying they've hit a paywall in the last uh, uh, week while consuming news. And it's clear, of course, that as desirable as this is from the publisher's point of view, from the point of view of the end user, this is not always a very welcome experience. So these are just a few quotes from the qualitative research, one uh, uh, person expressing a sort of a slight discontent that this is not always clearly flagged in advance, whether you will in fact hit a paywall. Um, this of course is something platform companies have, uh, have long uh, focused on in their decisions around this, but are being pushed to change. Uh, but also, if you will, a broader uh, preference for things that are free. I mean, I like free things as well. Um, but a, a clear uh, preference, if you will, for many consumers uh, for news that is free at the point of consumption. The move uh, here for a more competitive space for subscriptions here, of course, are competing not only with other news providers, but also other subscription services like Netflix and, and Spotify and the like, is tied in with the increasing dominance of the smartphone. I think a dominance that is probably obvious for most of us here in the room. It's worth just sort of tracking how pervasive this is in terms of the public at large of how people access digital news. So in a few years, uh, in just a few select markets here, we've been tracking this since 2013, this is the percentage of online news users who uh, uh, report that the smartphone is their main device for accessing online news. So in just in a few years, we've moved to the situation in which the mobile screen is sort of the defining device of digital news and the interface through which people access a very large share uh, of the many, many digital services and products that they use, including news uh, itself. And of course, this is a very different environment from that of the sort of laptop and desktop internet that some of us in the room uh, uh, grew up with, if you will, or, or were first accustomed to when we thought about uh, digital. By now, this is a clear majority behavior. This is changing also the ways in which people access news uh, first thing in the morning. So in many markets, though, it's not probably not the case for people in this room. For a long time, TV and radio were the first points of contact with news in the day. By now, a quarter say that they get news first on the smartphone uh, in the U.S., up from 17% just a few years ago. And if you look at people under 35, it's uh, almost 40% who say their first point of contact with news in the day is smartphones, in, in that particular case, uh, often through various forms of social media like Twitter, uh, Facebook, or Snapchat. The uh, move to uh, mobile and smartphones is also uh, in, in part tied in with sort of the reinvention of the aggregator, the mobile aggregator taking the place of the portal or desktop aggregator we have known for so long. So this is just the percentage of people in the US and the UK broken down here by um, operating system and device provider who say that they rely on mobile aggregators for news. So in this case, we have uh, about a quarter basically in the US and the UK saying that they rely on Apple News if they are on an Apple device. So a very, very significant reliance uh, on aggregators within that particular um, environment. This rise of aggregators is only one example of how the dominant role of platforms continue to evolve um, around the world. Um, sorry, I'm just going to uh, uh, quickly go through this. This example of sort of the naturalization of some of these services that from the qualitative research, this idea that this is just a built-in experience of having a certain kind of device is the aggregation of news by a service that is largely taken for granted and, and often where the value is not always, if you will, ascribed to the publisher, in fact, behind the content. This development uh, is tied in with a larger evolution of the platform uh, environment. I want to dwell here uh, for a few minutes, particularly on the role of uh, private messaging services and the rise of groups within both messaging applications and social media uh, of various sorts. But I think it's worth just also just pausing for just a second on sort of the top line finding, if you will, around the role of platforms and how people access and use news around the world. We ask in the survey, we ask people to identify 
a number of different ways in which they have come across, access, and used news online in the last week, and most people will identify a wide range of different ways in which they've gotten news. They will have gone to websites for news, they will have gone to social media, they will have used search, they will have used aggregators, and so on and so forth. And then we do a follow-up question where we ask people to name off the ones that they have uh, selected, which one is your main way of getting news online? And in 2019, across 38 markets, this is sort of the top line finding there, that just 29% of our respondents say that going directly to the website or app uh, of a news publisher is their main way of getting online news. And 71% identify various forms of site door access, uh, whether via, via um, platform products and services like search, social, and aggregators, or via site doors that are, to a larger extent, offered and controlled by publishers themselves, like mobile alerts and email <coughs> newsletters. Um, this also, I think, indicates a sort of a wider systemic shift, where by now, if we look just at those forms of site door access that are largely reliant on various forms of automated curation, algorithmic um, uh, display decisions, that by now we have 53% uh, of our respondents saying that their main way of accessing online news is search, social, or aggregators, so, so ways of access that are reliant on algorithmic selection, that are by now more popular than the various forms of editorial uh, selection. The um, underlying shift uh, that's underway in this environment, increasingly dominated by platforms in terms of the discovery um, of news, is one in which uh, people say that they are spending less time on Facebook, um, spending more time on a number of other uh, sites, whether video sharing sites like YouTube, messaging applications like WhatsApp, or social uh, sites like Instagram, some decline on uh, Snapchat too, and, uh, and a slight increase amongst a small number of people who uh, use Twitter. Uh, but it's one in which there is no downwards trend in the overall use of Facebook across the markets um, we uh, track. So 64%, basically staple number of people say that they've used Facebook in the last week for any purpose, whereas we see similar stagnation with Twitter where there is very significant growth in terms of WhatsApp, in terms of Instagram, and some growth in the case of Snapchat. Turning from sort of overall use for any purpose and looking specifically at, um, as, at these platforms as a way of getting news, we've seen a decline in terms of the percentage of people who say they get uh, news via Facebook, uh, perhaps uh, in part driven by some decline, uh, reported decline in organic posting and time spent, but also, of course, by algorithmic changes that Facebook have announced very publicly, a slight reduction in the role of news on the platform as part of the company's strategy. Uh, while in parallel, we've seen growth uh, in the percentage of people who say that they get news via other platform products and services like WhatsApp and Instagram. And I think it's important to recognize here that in terms of the average across the 38 markets we cover, by now, more people say they get news via WhatsApp than say they get news via Twitter which I think is not always obvious to journalists who are often are quite partial to the light blue um, option on the screen. There are very significant country-to-country -country differences in the importance of a platform like WhatsApp. So these are just a few markets that I highlight here. I should say India here is not part of the main digital news report, but we did a standalone report uh, focused on India released in March this year in advance of the elections, looking specifically at English language internet users in India. So a small set of the overall Indian market. But it gives you here an, an indication, if you will, of the percentage of people in that subset of the Indian market and amongst online news users in South Africa and Brazil who say that they get news via a platform like WhatsApp. So in these countries, about half of online news users are getting news uh, via WhatsApp. Whereas in the United States, for example, it's only 4% in this year's survey who say they get news via WhatsApp. WhatsApp for news is, of course, in part about sort of the, 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 more, the more intimate, more private space, the serendipity that comes with sharing in these environments. It is perhaps also, at least uh, as far as we can tell from reporting done on these issues and research done, for example, by the BBC and by First Draft and, and others, an environment in which there is a considerable potential for misinformation, in particular in situations where people are part of groups with people they don't know and groups that are sometimes instrumentalized by other actors for other purposes, if you will. So it's an environment with many advantages that consumers and users are embracing for, for often for good reasons, but also, of course, as other environments, uh, an environment with some structural vulnerabilities to manipulation and misinformation. The move here is not just about the move to private uh, messaging applications, but also about the role of groups. So across our 38 markets, of those who use WhatsApp, 
76% uh, say they are also active in various groups, and 63% of those who s use Facebook say they are also active in various groups. And we should recognize here, of course, that most of these groups are not about news, they're not about politics, they're about many other things. That, uh, I think most of us can recognize this from our own life, uh, sort of everyday coordination and, and social uh, uh, matters more than, than public affairs and, and, and politics. Uh, but amongst those who do use these groups for sharing news or discussing politics, in our survey data, the people who do that tend to be more male, uh, more highly educated, which we were quite interested uh, in this and somewhat surprised by this finding, more political partisan, and also more distrustful of established media. How important these groups are vary a lot from country to country. This is just a breakdown of some of the countries we cover in the report. So a range really here from countries like Turkey where almost a third of respondents say that they are using Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups to discuss news and politics to uh, countries like Australia, Canada or Ireland where this is a much smaller subset of the population. And as we have found with uh, private messaging applications and sometimes social media in previous research, this is often in part about uh, a sense of distrust towards established media and also a sense of um, a, a concern about the possible consequence of being seen as discussing politics in more public spaces that leads to a preference for discussing this as more controlled environments, whether Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups. This issue of distrust, of course, of political institutions, but also sometimes of the media itself, I think is also worth uh, just drilling into a little bit um, uh, in terms of that fundamental premise, if you will, of much of our work about the connection between journalism and its audience. Um, the trust issues, I think, are widely discussed. I think it's also important to flag here the concerns over misinformation. We ask a question of people about thinking about online news. I'm concerned about what is real and what is fake on the internet, where by now 55% of our respondents across 38 markets say that they are concerned about this. And in some countries like the UK, where there's been a very vigorous public and political debate about this in the last year or so, there's been a very significant increase in the expressions uh, of concerns. Uh, people are acting on these concerns. So in our survey, um, we have 26% saying that this concern has led them to rely more on what they consider to be more reputable news sources. And a quarter saying that they've stopped using what they consider to be sources with a less accurate reputation. We leave this to the respondent, him or herself, to define. We do not give them sort of, you know, an, a University of Oxford approved list of these are reputable and these are, you know, things you need to stay away from. We believe very firmly that people are often best positioned to make these judgments themselves. And I think we need to recognize here what that means in terms of that judgment. So just to sort of break out what trust means in an environment like the United States. Um, this is the top line level of trust in, uh, uh, it expressed in the question of I believe you can trust most news most of the time, broken down by political uh, affiliation in the United States, where you have a situation before the 2016 presidential election where there is some gap between the left and the right, but not much. And then after the election uh, of President Trump, a very significant change where uh, trust on the left jumps uh, a lot, 17 percentage points, in a way, I think it's very hard to attribute solely uh, to change in editorial practice, if you will. It may, <laughs> in, in part, reflect political dispositions, if you will. And similarly, a decline, initially a small decline, but subsequently a very, very significant decline in trust in news amongst people who identify uh, as being on the political right. If we imagined that left-leaning uh, Americans were a country, the level of trust here would be on par with what you see in countries like Finland, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden the highest we, uh, we find in our, uh, in our international work. And if you imagine that conservative or right-wing America was its own country, the level of trust here is the lowest by far of any country we've looked at, even lower than, Korea or, uh, than South Korea or even lower than Greece. This is the lowest level of trust we see in the uh, countries that we study. It plays out at the brand level as well, of course. Um, so this is a uh, numbers uh, on the Right side, you see the number on a scale from zero to 10 of the level of trust of those who use a brand. And on the left side, the score from zero to 10 of everyone who has heard of a brand. So there are some brands that are relatively widely trusted, uh, like local television news, the Wall Street Journal. And there are others uh, like Fox News uh, or uh, Vox and to an even greater extent Breitbart that may be trusted by those who use the brand but are not broadly trusted by the public at large. So this reliance on reputable brands depends an awful lot on the eye of the beholder. For someone who's clearly on the left, a reputable brand may well mean Vox. For someone on the right, it may well mean Breitbart or Fox News. 
the issue here, however, goes beyond uh, trust. So if you think about what it is that journalism offers to the public, uh, the bottom line, I suppose, is uh, at least the, the original aspirations in part is to keep people up to date about what's going on in the world. And when we ask people about this, 62% of our respondents say that they feel the news media does a pretty good job of keeping them up to date with what's going on in the world. But that is not the entirety, if you will, of the aspiration of professional journalism. And I think it's probably more concerning to see that just 51% of our respondents feel that the news media help them understand the news of the day. Just over half of our respondents. And I suppose for us, this is a question about whether there is an opportunity to close this expectation gap and whether journalism needs to think about the way in which it as a profession, as, an in, as a news industry, delivers on the ambition of, as Walter Lippmann put it, to make the invisible world visible to the citizen of the modern state and in fact empower people, as Antonio suggested in his opening, to make the decisions they feel are right for them, to live the life that they want to live, to build towards a society that they want to live in. And the concerns are not just about this, about whether news media help people understand the world and what goes on in the world. It's also much broader than that. So just looking specifically at the United States, here are some of the concerns people express in the survey. 43% say the news media is often too negative. This is particularly pronounced amongst people who are in the political right. 40% say they feel worn out by the amount of news these days. I suppose journalists would say this is not solely about journalism, but also about the amount of news these days. Um, and finally, 41% say that they often actively try to avoid news, to get news. So I think we have a much, much wider and more complex issue here around the connection between journalism and the public than just the issue of trust, as troubling as that is. There's a much wider issue here about whether, in fact, the public that journalism aims and claims to serve feels that journalism delivers on the mission, the principles, the purpose that it claims for itself. There are some who are trying to develop new forms of journalism to address some of this. I'm not sort of name checking these because uh, they necessarily are perfect at what they do, but I think there are examples of different ways in which people are trying to sort of slow down news provision, focus on more solutions oriented or constructive stories like World Hacks at the BBC, or thinking about a different relationship uh, with the audience than that that has characterized established media. Now, none of these, as said, are perfect, and some of them have tried international expansions in a way that didn't play out so well for them or weren't so well received. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's good to see innovation that is not just about business models of distribution, but also about editorial production itself, the nature of journalism itself and its relations with its audience. The final thing I want to cover uh, before we, we open up for the discussion with the panel and later uh, uh, questions or, or suggestions and comments from, from people in the room is the issue of voice uh, and audio, where we see uh, a set of part of this overall development of the platform environment uh, arise in the number of people who report that they have uh, smart speakers and use smart speakers. This is a very rapid increase uh, from 2017 to 2019 in terms of the, by now, a sort of a sizable minority of people in both the UK and the US who report having smart speakers in their home. So far, however, it's not obvious that this is necessarily also meant that people use these devices for news. So um, this here on the left side, you see the uh, number of people who say that they have a smart speaker in their, uh, in their uh, house. And on the right side, the dark blue is the percentage of people who say that they've used it for news. So here, perhaps some room for improvement, both for publishers and for platform companies in terms of thinking about where news fits into that experience of the voice operated interface and the various devices to give us access to it. But audio, of course, goes well beyond voice. Um, and the uh, one instantiation we see of that is the uh, increase in the number of people who say they listen to podcasts. By now, 36% say they've listened to a podcast in the last month. I would suspect in a room like this is probably 95%, but we are truly exceptional in many ways. Um, not just in showing up on a Monday uh, to discuss things like this, but also in this way, perhaps. And 15% say that they are listening to podcasts about news or politics. And, and again, the numbers here are higher amongst younger news consumers than amongst the public at large. And we see more and more publishers uh, in expanding their audio offerings and offering new podcasts that are, some of them are sort of current affairs features, long form programs, but also some of them are more about regular news habits and daily delivery, as in the case of The Daily from the New York Times and, 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 and today explained from Vox and Watch News from the Wall Street Journal and others who are increasing their offers in this space. What do uh, people want from these uh, offerings? Uh, we uh, offer some different options here and just break down the uh, responses by age. 
And it's clear that amongst older people who listen to podcasts, the primary use cases are around being updated and learning something, whereas for younger users, it's a wider range of different things where the update in itself is often le less important. And some of this is about a desire to fill empty time uh, with something that can't always be music, so a sort of diversity of experiences, if you will, that has to be entertaining in addition to something that is about learning something and being updated. And I think you can see from some of the qualitative research we've done just sort of different examples that many of us in the room can probably recognize from our own lives and our own lived experience of some of the value and some of the, uh, if you will, the attractions of this format of the podcast and what it is that it offers us. Something that's great for multitasking, literally the ease, uh, the, the, uh, the form of media use that is not reliant on me having eyes on a screen or hands on a device. I can do other things while enjoying this. Uh, it's uh, about an experience of being in control, the on-demand uh, experience of this. I think it's by, by now quite difficult to explain to someone under 20 why a white guy somewhere far away should decide what you can listen to and when, uh, uh, which is not immediately intuitive for someone who's grown up with choice. Um, and finally, about diversity, uh, not just in terms of choice, but also in terms of the genres that are used where I think we have seen again and again that podcast is one of the digital genres that have allowed for some experimentation with the ways in which people present news and current affairs, conversational styles, the diversity of voices, and the ways in which news is presented and offered up to the public. So with these uh, key findings, I wanted to just sort of highlight a couple of possible emerging questions, but really what we should hear is what this means for the people on the panel and for the people in the room, but let me just quickly run through some of the emerging questions as I see it before we hand it over to Emily and the panelists. Um, can we, the sort of the royal we, the collective we of the news industry and journalism and those who care about it, build on this greater reliance on reputable news brands, and is there a financial opportunity here, a business case, for trying to build uh, a, a digital business of news on, a, on the idea of being a reliable provider that stands out from the noise that most of us experience online? But also, similarly, how can publishers think about this findings that people are worn out by the news? They find it depressing, and they often don't actually find that news helps them understand the world. I think there is a deeper issue here that goes well beyond the question of distribution or business, uh, and is about the, the acts of journalism themselves, if you will. How much further can pay models go? It's very clear we see sort of a move towards uh, pay models in many parts of the publishing industry. It's a move that I think is very encouraging for some titles, but it's also clear that from a consumer point of view, a lot of news is not worth paying for. A lot of news is still offered free at the point of consumption. A lot of that news is good enough, uh, even if other news that might require payment might in some way be better. There is a lot of very high quality news freely available, so how far can pay models go? Is there a subscription fatigue? And are there opportunities for other ways of, uh, of operating pay models than just the bundled subscription product that we know so well? Are there other options here, bundled content or changes in pricing? How can the industry respond to the move to private networks and groups uh, around misinformation, but also about the ways in which we deliver our journalism and connect with the people we are trying to serve? And finally, around voice and audio, how can publishers make the most of the rise of voice and the pivot to audio that's being pushed so heavily by the tech industry and that seems to be finding an uptake amongst consumers now. I don't have answers to any of these questions, so I will hand that over to Emily and the panelists to give their answers to this, what they think this means for their organization and the future of journalism. But thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Rasmus. I'd like to invite um, the panel to take the stage. Uh, and if you want to take your seats, panel, I will um, Make sure you don't fall off the stage. Please make sure you don't fall off the stage. Um, I'm going to take this chair at the end if uh, you want to sit up there some in any particular order. Right, so I was furiously scribbling notes there. Um, first of all, uh, Rasmus gave a very brief introduction. I'm going to give a brief introduction, but I'll also invite the uh, panelists to say a little bit more about what they do um, and what their involvement is. Uh, I'm going to start, this is, my, my, this is a joke that I always use, uh, so when nobody laughs I know that it's time for me to retire. So <laughs> on, my, on my extreme left, um, but only positionally, um, is time to retire. As far as you know. Uh, <laughs> as far as I know, <laughs> um, it's Marcus Mabry, who's the Senior Director of Mobile Programming for CNN uh, Digital, 
and um, he will probably reveal this uh, when he talks a bit about his work, but at one point he also worked for Twitter as well, so he has, as it were, seen life on both sides of the divide. Uh, next uh, to him is uh, the person who's going to be the most popular person in the room, uh, Latoya Drake, uh, because she is one of the founders of the uh, Google News Initiative here in the US, um, and previously came from the uh, Google News Lab, and they are one of the few places that is actually giving money to journalists. Don't all rush at once. Um, next to her, great um, to have Gadia uh, Tubman back at the journalism school where she was uh, an, an award-winning alum, actually. Uh, and she's a political reporter for Yahoo News. Um, and she's really, 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 really looking forward to 2020. I haven't got that written down anywhere. I'm just <laughs> detecting that she's really, really, really looking forward to 2020. And then right next to me is uh, Francesco Marconi. Um, welcome back again, Francesco, who a couple of years back was a Tau fellow here. And he's now head uh, or chief at the, of R&D at uh, the Wall Street Journal. Um, and somebody told me this could be incorrect, and he can uh, fact check me, so apologies for the fake news. Um, uh, that you're working on something like 110 different projects around AI at the moment at the journal, is that right? Yeah, about, about it. Okay, yeah. you must be generating those by robot, I'm guessing. Um, so we have a fantastic uh, panel which uh, spans the industry. I, I slightly regret we don't have anyone from local journalism up here, but I know that we have people in the audience from local journalism, so uh, it would be great to hear as well from, from, from you because I think it would be it's a sort of an important perspective. Um, so I'm going to kind of come down the line. So I'll start with you, uh, Marcus. So you know, Rasmus is. Um, I I think last year I described the slides of doom. Um, this year I was not so sure actually, but I just wondered what your kind of um, reactions are to these, uh, what seem to be the key talking points of. Uh, free media is slightly in uh, recession. You know, we're talking about the rise of paid, but we're still talking about sort of difficult levels of trust, uh, and that's particularly polarised. Now, at CNN, you guys obviously, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, polarisation seems to be a good thing uh, for um, the cable news networks who continue to do really well in this environment. Does any of the, does any of sort of Rasmus's findings, uh, do they? Re resonate really with uh, cable cable news? I, I think all of them do actually um, right. and even that one where you could argue that cable does benefit television at least does benefit uh, from the partis partisanization uh, and the increasing partisanization partisan uh, divides in America um, but there is a breaking point or a tipping point uh, we can certainly at CNN we believe we can have a much larger audience if everyone comes to us than if only one side comes to us uh, and we're not interested in only one side coming to us. And in the cable universe, certainly in television, one could argue uh, that you know MSNBC and Fox have staked out their corners. Um, we don't want to have staked out our corners, uh, and we have seen the challenges, especially from those who you saw that you know that nine percent, right? That's the most worrying number number of all for us at CNN is that only nine percent of Americans who identify themselves as right leaning have faith in the media. Mm -hmm. Well, that's 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 terrible. That's not just terrible for us, because we are that media, but it's also terrible for democracy. Uh, if they don't believe us, and increasingly if they believe, say, lies that come from the podium of the White House, that's a bad thing. When truth and facts are no longer what people care about, that's super scary for democracy. And that's much worse. I mean, so that's a business problem for us, because those people aren't coming to us. If they don't believe us, they're not going to come to us. Uh, although we do have a lot, we have a surprising number of, amount of overlap with Fox because people, I think, want to, kind of in the old days, it used to be in Europe, this was a very common thing. You read one publication for the left side of the view, one publication for the right. We weren't supposed to like, like that in America. We supposedly did objectivity, quote unquote. This is a new world for us, and so it makes a great difference at CNN. Uh, and it, it does slow potentially our growth, right? Um, we want to be the news source for everybody. And so we work really hard to get that. and to. We have an editorial content strategy that is aimed to, you know, bringing those folks back. We talk all the time about what our editorial content strategy can be to, very, in a very transparent way, talk to all sides of the political spectrum in America. But it is changing how we do our jobs and how we envision our journalism. So I'm going to come back to you um, once we've gone down the line and we'll talk a little bit about solutions because I think that, you know, there's clearly a, a, a lot to go out there. Um, but Latoya, I just want to talk about, you know, the difference between last year and this year for Google is that Google has announced in the um, interim that you're putting $300 million into the news market in the US over the next three years, roughly $100 million a year. 
Facebook is matching you, the Knight Foundation is matching you. So that's about a billion dollars coming into um, the news business that was not there before. Uh, why is Google doing this? I do want to clarify one thing. That's sure. global. The 300 million is not just concentrated in the US. Oh, but okay. last year. OK, in that case, they're all much less excited. <laughs> <laughs> Still excited. But, 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 right. so, I, so I thought, I apologize, because I did think that, that 300 million was just in the US. It's global. So last year, we announced the Google News Initiative, which is really our effort to understand the challenges within the industry and figure out how Google can be part of change and energizing growth. Really, for us, there are three areas that we focus on. One, one is quality journalism, and I think there are a lot of takeaways that we saw in the slides around mis and disinformation. We also think a lot about evolving business models. For us, we can't run away from the conversation around revenue and subscriptions and how can we really accelerate change among more than just the top three. And then around technology and how can we, we really bring emerging technology into the newsroom. The one that I'll, I'll, I'll really touch on here, but I think is really important and compelling to, to coming out of the data, is the conversation around subscriptions. A lot of the work that we've done is really by listening and in collaboration with many folks in this room and outside of this room. Um, and so that point about subscriptions and who's getting the biggest piece of the pie, one of the things for us is we launched something called Subscribe with Google, which is really helping newsrooms think about, again, new revenue models. And sometimes that means subscriptions, sometimes that means contributions. But how can we, to the point of the slide we saw, get beyond it being concentrated among a handful? We saw the top three on that slide above earlier. We think deeply about the local newsrooms that you mentioned earlier, Emily. What, what is it that we can do to make sure they see a cut of that revenue? How can we take some of our technology and some of our resources, some of our understandings, and take that to local newsrooms so that it doesn't feel like this effort, um, one, is a $300 million price tag or just a $300 million stunt, but really to understand the challenges that are beyond just a handful, but really changing the industry really more holistically. And I'll, I'll say this to that point, um, to, to put a fine point on it and to get really tangible about what we're doing. Earlier this year, we announced something called the Local Subscriptions Lab. That's a, a collaboration with the LMA to, again, figure out these learnings, really roll up sleeves and get into those smaller newsrooms to help them grow so that hopefully next year, when we're looking at this slide, we're not talking about subscriptions revenue for a few, but we're hearing from and understanding how we've helped uh, local publishers continue to thrive and really get a bigger a piece of the pie than what they might be getting right now. Uh, last year on this very stage, we practically had a fist fight between Campbell Brown and Mar Thompson, and I'm going to try and discourage actual physical violence this year. I would um, pay to see that. That'd be, that's pay per view. I was going to say, actually, sorry, yes, as Mark has just pointed <laughs> out, I will be encouraging physical violence in, the, in a few minutes. Um, so, so I do want, I sort of want to put a pin in that point about what Google is doing um, to help news organizations, because I think there's a bigger question that we can all talk about, about whether tech companies, not just Google, actually have, should have that role. Um, so we're going to come oh. back to that. Um, Kadir, now you're, you're a political reporter. Yes. Um, and we're talking there <clears> about <throat> trust, we're talking about polarization. A lot of your coverage is um, around uh, marginalized communities. Uh, you know, we have a huge issue here with 2020 coming up and voter registration. We've had one of the biggest stories, you know, here and in the world is the immigration story. Yep. How does that look from a reporter's point of view in a newsroom? I mean, when Rasmus went through the trust slide, that's the one that hit me the hardest. Um, because when it comes to our newsroom, our audience is split down the middle. Um, they're everywhere, for one. Um, we have about 100 million people coming to us every month. But they're evenly split between Democrats and Republicans or conservatives and liberals. And so when you write our stories, it can go either way, depending on the topic. If it's especially about Trump, which it often is, I, I just today tallied up um, my stories that I've done in the year that I've been working at Yahoo News. 49% of them have Trump in the headline, um, where it's only 15% of them are was, not Trump focused. I was going to say, what, what are you writing about the other 51%? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's incredible, exactly. Um, but then I, to the ratio for every non-Trump story I do, uh, there are three Trump stories to, I guess, keep the lights on to write it. Um, because that's what our audience wants. Uh, that's what they, they're looking for. And in this age, when we're seeing that folks, or what the report has said is that we're seeing from the right side, uh, less and less trust, 
um, from our audience who are half on the right side, we're seeing a lot of trust. They're coming back to us in our focus groups. They're coming back and saying they come to us for balanced news. And that might be a part of our branding. It might be a part of how long we've been around or the fact that we've just been an aggregator for so long. Um, we didn't necessarily have a voice in the news until recently when we've been doing a lot of high level original investigative reporting in, in less than like the last decade. Um, so the trust there, I think, really depends on, I, I, I challenge it to say, do people trust us or do they agree with us? Do they agree with the headlines we're putting out there um, rather than just questioning it? Do you put different headlines on the same piece? Do you put left leaning and right leaning? No, we don't. We don't, but we do workshop our headlines. Right. We do, as a team, um, we are looking at, and the team is very diverse in, in regards to political perspectives. We all strive for objectivity, but we also have very different identities. But as I was telling my colleague here on the panel, um, I was the only woman of color for a while on the team. But that didn't mean to say that the and, person- And how big is that team? Team is about, for my news team specifically, there's about 30 of us maybe right. around the country, if not the world. Um, and, but the other particular interesting part about that is that they didn't need me to come on to talk about voting rights or disenfranchising of you know, black voters in the South because there were already people covering that. Um, so when I joined, they just wanted to make sure my diversity came from me being a millennial and also me coming from the perspective of that I covered audience measurement. And I was always looking at audience and how we can better reach them. So with that, I think, at the end of the day, our audience is look, our, what our newsroom is looking to do is diversify our audience by diversifying ourselves. Right, so, uh, and again, I think I want to put a pin in that and come back to it, which is this idea of trust, and we talk about diversity a lot, and diversity is a business problem, yeah. as well as you know a, a democratic problem, and how hard it has been to get uh, news organizations to shift in that way, so, so we'll, we'll come back to that as well. Before that, though, talking of multivariate testing and different headlines, different audiences, Francesco, um, from the technology perspective, um, do you see uh, Rasmus's uh, findings, you know, news avoiders, et cetera, as, 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 you know, can technology solve these things? Can it solve um, the issue of how we get people to pay for news? Uh, or do we need to kind of focus more on paying reporters, not developing robots? Well, I think it's a collaboration between the, you know, the human journalists and the machines, obviously. Um, having certain types of technology can uh, improve the, the monetization of, of news organizations. For example, the Wall Street Journal's paywall uh, is powered by machine learning, and we have uh, 52 or 58 um, variables that know exactly when to show you different types of of uh, promotions and uh, when to show you the article for free. But um, in reality, there's, you know, beyond the, the end of the spectrum of, of distribution, technology can really enhance the entire process. Um, and that's some of the work that I've been doing uh, in this new role at the journal, where we are looking specifically at uh, new ways that data science and machine learning can be applied to uh, news gathering as well as uh, the, the production of, of content. And, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about trust and trust is indeed, you know, the strongest business model. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen just last quarter 19% uh, growth in our digital only subscription. Uh, Rasmus show, I believe, 1.4. We are now at 1.8 uh, digital only subscribers, which is about 68% of, of, the, of the overall subscription. And to get to that level of, of trust, uh, one, one approach, uh, at least at the journal, is to really have this analytic, analytical perspective um, in regards to trying to quantify the world. So many of the projects that uh, we do focus on you know, uh, gathering all of these different documents and trying to turn something that is complex and, uh, and broad into something that is more quantifiable. Um, and so one last thought on sort of the, the A-B testing and, um, you know, testing headlines and looking at different ways of using um, editorial algori algorithms. Uh, the journal uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't, um, all the, for example, the front page is all powered by, by humans. Um, and so we think that it's, it's an editorial decision and therefore there, there shouldn't be a machine intervention there. 
terrible idea that the machines do it. Um, sorry, no, that's, so, so actually sort of on that technology point, um, let's just go back a little bit to uh, what the toilets say, because we've talked about um, how the rising uh, model is subscription. Um, you know, you are an organization which has been deeply investing in subscription at the journal for a long time. And um, we have two kind of free news platforms, advertising supported media platforms. You know, is it, I mean, the, the kind of, the elephant in the room here is that mobile advertising is pretty much all going to Google or Facebook at the moment. Um, and there are discussions in uh, Washington about antitrust uh, fixes for the first time kind of ever. Are we allowing ourselves to give up on advertising as an industry a little bit too easily? And I wonder to what extent that narrative is, is, is led by the Apples, the Facebooks, and the Googles saying we can develop subscription technology to help you forget about advertising. I just wondered what you, you guys think about I, that. I don't know if it's more interesting to hear that answer from us first or from Latoya first. <laughs> I'll let you go first, I mean, Marcus, and then. I, 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 and I'll happily start because before I was at CNN, like you said, I was at Twitter, and before I was at Twitter, I was at the New York Times. Right. And so, you know, um, I'm very comfortable with that, that um, business model. Uh, and it, it's kind of, it's a, it's a mixed business model, right? So it's subscri subscriptions, but also still a good deal of advertising, both digital and, and, and print, right? In the case of, uh, you know, most publishers um, who do it. Um, and now I'm a part of AT&T. And so, you know, certainly I think what we'd say at CNN and AT&T is, um, you know, Facebook, Google, um, Apple have owned that world. Um, I don't know if it's fair to say that publishers let them own it, or if through a lack of technological innovation and a lack of listening to consumers and a, a lack of getting, and this is my Twitter mind maybe talking, a lack of getting the UI and the UX right, we let them own it. We seeded it, right, rather than you know, them taking it. Um, I don't know which, who's to blame. Uh, if there is blame, right, because to kind of complain about that also feels a little bit to me like trying to hold back the ocean. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, just, or, you know, claim about the weather, we'll just get an umbrella, right? Um, or build your own umbrella, or, or build a weather machine. And that's where I think AT&T and CNN kind of come in. I'm happy to be a part of AT&T because they, don't, they are the only platforms right now. They don't have to say they're the only platforms. And so I think AT&T would definitely say that we have a role to play as publishers uh, and people who know content to, to actually get into that game too. So we don't have to see that, that world, but we have so far. And, and we shouldn't. Uh, I feel a lot um, kind of like we used to have this old... I'm a very old black queen. Uh, we <laughs> used to have this old saying in the black community uh, of, you know, should black journalists work for black publications or for mainstream publications, where we're going to have to make a lot of compromises and explain ourselves a lot. And we used to say in ABJ, the National Association of Black Journalists, we have to be everywhere. And so same thing with, with media. We have to be everywhere as far as our revenue sources. They, they need to be advertising-based. They need to be subscription-based as well. Some product, some level of subscription. Which, as Rasmus said, it's not necessarily a subscription, but something the audience is willing to pay for, because there is something in that value exchange, I believe, too. Uh, and then, then finally, it needs to be more direct to consumer as well. So it must be every revenue stream we can, we need to exploit. In the end, will that whatever that revenue base is, support a newsroom the size of CNN's or, or, or the New York Times in and of themselves, I'm kind of doubtful. I'm, I'm getting really happy to be part of a phone company where, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're A&T and T fee every they're month. Do, they're doing quite well financially. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I would exactly. say the same thing for Yahoo News and HuffPo, which all sit under Verizon right. Media and Verizon Company. So we're in the same similar boat. And one of the benefits I've, I've talked about as being a part of Yahoo News, which is also part of Verizon, is that we don't have to be in that game. We don't have to worry as much right. as some other news organizations. If I, was, if I was an independent local news organization listening to this, I would be absolutely terrified yes. and probably quite angry. What about the tiny independent Wall Street Journal? <laughs> which is, well, the tiny independent Wall Street, Street Journal. Because, <laughs> you know, the, 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 it, it's a well known, it's well documented that your. Um, owner, uh, Rupert Murdoch, has had a pretty adversarial, and Robert Thompson, who's the, the, the CEO there, have had a pretty adversarial relationship with Google in the past, saying, we have to like, resist uh, all of this. Um, what's the kind of actual kind of internal view? Because you're working on the same technologies, which I guess, you know, kind of Google could, you know, they have dozens and dozens and dozens of machine learning and um, natural language processing kind of specialists. You're talking about developing independent technologies. Is that a completely lost cause? 
uh, in terms of, I mean, the thing is to develop the types of tools and, um, and uh, processes that, you know, news organizations are, um, are developing, we'll need to rely on, you know, cloud computing from, from these large um, tech organizations such as Google and Amazon. So the idea of building everything from scratch, building, you know, a machine learning model from scratch is, is actually pretty challenging and I, I you know, I'm not sure if uh, any of us in the news industry have the budgets to uh, devote billions of dollars to, to R&D. But in, in regards to the, you know, the perspective uh, or, uh, between the re of the relationship between the journal and technology companies, I think that's, uh, that's evolving. You, you likely heard about the collaboration or partnership with Apple News. Um, there's a similar uh, uh, agreement in place with, with Twitter. And I think that signals that um, platforms, or at least some platforms, are recon recognizing the value of high quality journalism and they are willing to pay for it. And then on the journal's perspective, it's an opportunity to, um, to expand our audience beyond just the, the members that subscribe to WSJ.com. Um, and, and so in that regard, on one side, you, you know, you're relying on sort of the infrastructure technology to develop tools to improve the journalism. And on the other side, uh, you know, issues related to, to monetization in, in partnerships and so on. Can I yeah, offer sure. a, yeah. a quick point? Yeah. Um, just going back to the question a little bit earlier, it's certainly one that Google doesn't run from and, and can't ignore the decline in ad revenue for publishers. It is then incumbent upon us because we rely on good quality journalism to figure out those new models for revenue. You talked about uh, Francesco um, having the R&D in house to use machine learning to figure out signals. For us, we are, are can't again escape the fact that it takes time, creativity, and resources. And these are things that Google has in house, and which leads us to think about propensity to, to subscribe, for instance, and how do we use our machine learning technology to identify audiences who have the propensity to subscribe and make that available to publishers? Because again, we do understand everyone's thinking about the new revenue models and what Google can do to energize that and accelerate it. So again, it's not something we run from, but we are thinking creatively about solutions and how do we work with publishers really collaboratively because we, we don't have all the answers, but we do want to do it in close collaboration. And so, so just to be, so I can be devil's advocate because I don't take any money from Google and they haven't offered me any either. So, but don't offer me any because that's not, that, but, but this, I mean, in the, you know, independence of Google and Facebook, I feel is going to become a huge issue for journalists and possibly independence from, you know, large telecoms companies as well. But particularly Google and Facebook because you play so many different roles. So if you're supporting local journalism, you're also selling software um, to schools and governments. You're also um, talking to, you know, defense companies. You're also trying to put self-driving cars on our roads. Just the scale of these organizations and what they do. I wonder how the rest of the panel and Latoura is a great person who's doing very good things for journalism. So, you know, as I say, I don't really want fisticuffs. But is it, you know, can we just ask a question about, is, have we got that role right? Which is, it feels as though Facebook and Google are kind of stepping into the shoes of any other, you know, organizing or funding kind of system for journalism. It feels like if you want to get anything done now, you have to go to one of the big tech companies okay. to get them to give you money. I, I think there's a, a natural tension both on the, the monetization discussion that we touched on, but also uh, increasingly on the, the issue of algorithmic transparency that uh, is becoming more and more of focus of, of many newsrooms. So uh, the, the idea of the algorithmic beat that the same way that we are able to um, ask questions from our sources, we should be able uh, to ask questions from these AI systems that are um, mediating different parts of our lives. And uh, the reality is that a lot of uh, these uh, uh, tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, you know, at, at times there, there are issues with privacy. The Wall Street Journal has, has reported on it on, on several occasions. And so, it's not only a, a business question, it's also an editorial question. That's a, you know, that's a big area of focus for the technology team, for the technology desk. As an example, we are, where we are specifically looking at issues like privacy and transparency and um, data ownership 
uh, and so on. I'm going to open it up for uh, questions from the audience, but I just want to kind of start. Um, uh, I have one more question. I'm going to start with uh, Kadir about the big one about 2020. So much as I think, you know, we should all be doing much more policy reporting all the time, we have yeah. lots of other things, that, that 2020 is rolling towards us um, like this huge kind of news juggernaut. Uh, <laughs> what's, what are your kind of, you know, we've had so much discussion, which I think has fed into <coughs> figures like people avoiding the news, mm -hmm. you know, people uh, not trusting journalism, etc. Um, about how we cover politics yet. It seems to me that people, are, I, I mean, I'd also like your views on are people really switching off the news? Because I haven't seen that in any figures at all. But what are you, how are you viewing 2020? Well, so to the point about policy, so we noticed that our readers were looking for more information on policies because we would include them in our, in our stories as much as we could, but it wasn't enough. And so we launched the Ideas Election series, which started at the top of the year, um, just literally taking every proposal that these candidates have had, because this is one of the most, if not the one um, biggest uh, ideas-led election that we're going to see in this, in this country's history, taking each proposal or several of the proposals and writing in-depth analysis of them each. And then I just saw like over the weekend that Vox even was promoting the fact that they have covered up to like 40 policies um, since the start of the year. So I see that there is a shift in, in newsrooms and especially in ours towards covering policies for 2020. Um, 2020 is here for us, that's, that's it. We literally had a meeting this morning it's just about covering debates um, and how we're gonna strategize around that and what it's going to look like. The thing is, like I said, we, we sit in Verizon Media so we have multiple teams working together on our strategy that's not just Yahoo News, it's HuffPo. It's Yahoo Finance, it's Yahoo Lifestyle. Um, all of us going to these, to, to these politicians, to these candidates, and to these debates, and to these campaign rallies, trying to cover what they're talking about. Now, to that, to that point, um, when it comes to our audience, is it too much for them? Are they turning it off? I don't think they are. I don't think they are at all. I mean, if I write, oh my God, if we write about Bigfoot and the FBI, you know, discovering Bigfoot, it, it will get two million clicks, and people will read it. Uh, like crazy, but then if we were to write about oil tankers and, um, and Iran attacking them, then we don't know what we're going to track, but it's, it's still going to do pretty well. Um, not as well as Bigfoot. But not as well as Bigfoot, sadly. <laughs> that is reality. <laughs> exactly. B Bigfoot, can, um, I just, can I just make the point? I know you're very experienced news people. Bigfoot doesn't really actually exist, so maybe kind of, uh, you know. Look. So moving on uh, to the misinformation. <laughs> so, so, so this has kind of landed, you know, this, this is something that obviously, again, um, you know, to some extent, I think the public are looking at tech companies and going, you know, uh, I know the media I like and I know the media I trust, but I don't know why Google is showing me this. I don't know why Facebook is showing I don't know why this has been shared with me. Is that something that you worry about or have I got the wrong end of the stick there? The piece of it that we worry about is really ensuring that we are servicing the best, the best search results to users. It's, it's not up to us and we try not to take the position of telling you what you should look at and what you should count as right for you. That's up to the user. To subscribe, we want to make sure we are delivering really authoritative news for people as they are searching for it. But you've, I mean, you know, I, I sort of wrote a little bit about this last week. Um, the Daily Mail, you know, they lost a lot of um, traction through an algorithm change. You know, we interview uh, dozens of people from both newsrooms and platform companies with some researchers coming out um, later this year. Just on, you know, the, the, the changes in algorithm and what effect that has is absolutely omnipresent in newsrooms. Mm -hmm. It seems as though, like you cannot, whatever your model is, you can't get away from that. But it also seems that you guys have had to kick a lot of people off platforms or down rank results in the last year. So it feels to me like we're going back to a kind of a, a normalization where in fact the news sources are narrow. Is that right? Yeah, well, and, and again, I mentioned authority. That's become the thing that we rely on as we think about what is it that we're giving people What are the, it, versus relying on freshness or who posted most recently. What is the authoritative source? And I get that there is a fine line between what one defines is authoritative and what gets to show up at, at the very top of the page as people are searching uh, for whatever it is that they may be interested in. But I would really, really underscore that that's where we index on, on really
really um, servicing the most authoritative information. And do you see, uh, you know, is Google kind of on high alert about 2020, or do you think that you've actually kind of sorted through the problems of misinformation? Mox is laughing. Yes, I'm gonna laugh. No, I don't. I don't know if this is something. It's so fast moving, and the issue is so complex and constantly changing. So no, we've not solved the problem. Mm. It's such a big issue that it's not one that Google can say, hey, we, we showed up today and we solved it. Everybody can can be okay and, and rest comfortably with the information that you're receiving. So no, it's not something that's solved, but it's something that we're constantly trying to iterate on and trying to get better at. And do you what go what do you what are you particularly looking at as being a, a threat. I mean, we hear a lot about deep fakes, but it seems like cheap fakes are more of a problem, which mm. is stuff that we kind of know is not true, but it's Child there fakes. anyway. Yeah, certainly we, we talk about deep fakes and synthetic media and really understanding. One, to step, to step back and go a layer deeper, these things do, they show up from time to time and we get it wrong and we try to fix it and rectify it as quickly as possible. But we also take the, the step of understanding how this affects consumers and how we work with the readers and really also educate them on what they're seeing. So you have the, the role that technology can play in terms of what's, what's being surfaced, but there's also a big piece of this that's how do we educate and media literacy is certainly a term that gets thrown around very casually. One that we try not to make so cavalier, but also making sure that, that readers uh, and news consumers understand what's in front of them so that they can also be judicious about not falling for something that's mis or disinformation. It's where I hope we can work together as partners, all of us in both yeah. tech and in, 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 in the news media, is to educate, right? Because I'm, I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death because I'm afraid of the gullibility of, you know, the French call le peuple, of the masses of people. I, I'm, I'm scared. And I'm scared sometimes we want to be deceived. We want to believe nonsense. And, 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 and that really, really frightens me because the tech is better than it's ever been before to deceive us when we don't even want to be deceived. So imagine when we are willingly deceived, which I think is such a, a large part of it. So our educating the public who wants to be educated is so key. And then, you know, people have to actually go out and, and use their voices and their education. Um, and it, it may be on the positive side of, of kind of Donald Trump rise of kind of, you know, the vilification of, of media and journalism and his attacks on, on democratic institutions throughout the, the nation, maybe on the positive side is more people are awake to their responsibilities as citizens than ever before. So there might be a willing populace out there for us to educate in partnership. Um, I hope there is. Uh, we're going to know, you know, any, any day now because 2020 is upon us and we'll see. Uh, but I think the, the I, I feel like the fatigue is very real. Um, certainly, so CNN, just on mobile, we have 116 million users just on mobile last month, right? And so we're the biggest U.S. publisher um, when it comes to the traditional publishers. Um, and so, but, and that's a record number, but on desktop, desktop home pages are declining, not just ours, but almost everybody's. And so it's about the platform, right? And you talk about the rise of, of, dominant, of, of mobile dominance uh, in, in the survey. Uh, that's real. So we have more audiences there, but most people on their phone are not looking at news. And so how do we insinuate ourselves, and technology can help here, in your life and the things you actually care about? Because what do you actually care about? You care about social, searching, shopping, and your shows. That's what you care about. It's not about news. It's so, true. So how so do we make ourselves house. relevant to you? Yeah. That's our great challenge, and it's very much technological. But you can't do that. You can't do that without the platforms, right? You can't do that, or you maybe can do it as you a phone company. You need or, some platform, yeah. yeah. But, right, but it doesn't right. have to be the platforms. No. Right. And uh, just to sort of go back to 2020, will um, it must be a nightmare for you on mobile, like all those people that CNN has on its panel shows. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like tiny, tiny hard screen. to fit them into a little screen? Yeah, it's quite hard, hard uh, to fit them into a little no, screen. No, the way we cut and dice the videos, it's fine. Um, yeah, no, it's fine. There's just lots of lots of room for voices. Do you, do you detect um, the kind of uh, sort of frustration with the horse race? You know, which is something. Oh yeah, that well, yeah I, I, that's what people yeah. are turning away from. I mean, right. people are. You know, it's all those Trump headlines. I mean. People are, are seriously turned off by it. And sometimes we'll headline do better for us when we headline test uh, without Trump in it, even <laughs> without Trump. And so we do those all the time. Um, just, who's doing really well at the moment? Who is, uh, which, which, what political stories are firing you? What name? Yeah. AOC. AOC. Yeah, is, I mean, it's, is, but it's so sad yeah. because I do feel like at Fox News and we were saying this earlier, yeah. Yeah. Like they use her kind of like as a red yeah. cape. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, 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 it's political hate. Yes. That's not yes. positive. Well, I, th I think it's both political hate, but to me it also feels like a really important moment in political journalism, which is where an individual politician can become the platform for media. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, if you're retweeted by AOC, 
then your story is going to do really, really well. And if she completely ignores you, then you are trying to get... It seems to me that there are lots of people trying to get in her feet. I don't know. That's just my, my observation. Um, question. So I, to, because they're both on that side, I'm going to start up there at the back and then come down here. No, in fact, my uh, college-age son has just come home to lie around the apartment uselessly. For If anyone has a job in political communications, please contact me. I have a candidate. Um, and I, I just mentioned AOC, and he said, to our generation, she is Jesus Christ. He <laughs> said, she is like that. Is like everybody talks about her left, right, etc. Sorry, let's go on. Um, so you all, sorry, my name is Cassiana. I'm a product manager at Axios. Um, you all touched on this just a little bit, but I think uh, as I listened to the report, the most terrifying statistic that I actually heard is that over 50% of Americans are really relying on aggregators for their news and 27% in Apple News alone. Um, so this really scares me for two reasons. Um, so one, from a user perspective, uh, this really devalues publishers because I think in those different um, aggregators, uh, we all look quite similar. Um, you know, there's various degrees depending on which one you're talking about. Um, but I think that it really like devalues um, uh, the idea of going for reputable news, right? Because we all look kind of the same. Uh, and then I think from the publisher perspective, it is truly, truly terrifying because the, the fundamental commodity that we have in an advertising-driven world is our connection with our audiences. And if we're having so much of our audience come in from platforms that we don't control who don't have a real connection to our brand, um, I think that really dilutes uh, our value proposition from an advertising perspective. Um, so I know that you know that you all on the panel, you know, two are owned by telecoms companies. Um, one of you uh, is working for um, you know one of the uh, companies that is really winning in this subscription business. But I think from uh, from our perspective, where you know we're kind of a startup media organization, um, I think we provide a lot of value in our content and coverage. Uh, but this world of aggregators and uh, increasing um, the concentration of power in the platforms uh, looks kind of scary to me. Like. Uh, am I am I missing something? Do you agree? Um. So you're scaring Cassia, <laughs> and <laughs> she's not easily scared. She used to be in one of my classes. She's really not easily scared. So is that? I mean, that to me that seems absolutely right, sort of right on. But um, you know, Google, what are you going to do about like publishers that, that are scared? I, I, and I, I understand what you're saying, and, and it's not falling on deaf ears. What I will tell you this. When we relaunched Google News uh, last year, one of the key features in, when I say features, it dis, I don't mean it was just something to look at it because it was shiny and pretty, but one of the things that we reacted to and responded to was how do we get more, more traffic to publishers and from a diversity of publishers, thinking about how can we make sure the reader isn't just coming and getting the same thing over and over and over. The idea there is that we are, if a, a particular story happens and you see the button called full coverage, the idea there is that hopefully we're opening, opening people up to more than what they are just accustomed to and we're exposing more brands and exposing more publishers who are telling a whole, a, a, a completely different side of the story than what the person may have originally been after. So again, for us, the idea is to, to not dilute the brand, but really expose the consumer, the reader, to as many different brands as possible as they start to learn and become um, uh, well-versed in a particular story that they might be exploring. I, I'm so enjoying Marcus's skeptical face. No, no, no. So, uh, so, I'm, 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 so what I'm thinking is, I, I hear you and I feel your pain, obviously. Um, but I feel like, um, how can how can that how can that that aggregation thing scare you more than 90% of conservatives not trusting us, not believing that we are when we give facts, they're facts. How can that scare you more? Number one. Number two. I feel like you know, it's not the aggregators. It's 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 our modern technological landscape. Even if no aggregation existed, anyone coming to us via a link, which is how most people come to all of us, they, we all look the same on the link. So I don't understand. I don't think they're the problem. So I, I hear you, but I also feel like, nah, you know, we have bigger problems than that. Um, and I'm interested in knowing what you, think, what you think the solution is, because you guys have to crack this nut, right? Because I do think D to C, which was now, you know, obviously the buzzword, direct to consumer, we have to have each publisher, we have to have a direct consumer relationship with our consumers. Because if we don't, then yeah. Axios, New York Times, Breitbart, whatever, it's all the same. And of course they're not, right? They're really, really different. But that's because a consumer who knows us knows that. And if we, and we have to have those relationships. As publishers, we have to cultivate them. I really hear you on the technological challenges. I just feel like, again, it's like, it's like you know, Gutenberg complaining, you know, complain, complaining when you, know, you can make you know, offset presses and everybody could have lots and lots of copies. I, well, we can't stop this technology. I don't understand 
how we keep fighting against it and complain about it. We need to figure out how to work with it, right? I mean, so I hear you being scared, but I'm not quite sure what yeah, you do with the fear. I, and if I could add, I mean, that's, that's a scary scenario, and obviously there are, uh, you know, for the, from the Wall Street Journal's perspective, we are monetizing the relationship with Apple News as an example. But even more scary scenario is when voice devices take over. And so when you're querying, when you're asking a question from the device and the device is uh, assembling different um, news sources, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a legal expert, but I'm not sure if that's considered derivative work or not. <laughs> So uh, that's, you know, that's the big question uh, in, in terms of scary scenarios in the next yes, few years. Question, question behind Liz. I'm uh, David Sutcliffe, and I'd like to follow up on the question that was just asked. It's been 17 days since the Justice Department has announced, as well as the Federal Trade Commission has announced, that they're starting to investigate Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, these companies uh, are getting attention from the federal government for a very good reason. They represent monopoly capitalism and the winner-take-all model. And the Wall Street Journal just published a headline recently saying that the tech platforms had basically stolen, what was it, $34 billion worth of revenue uh, from the publishers. Now, the Europeans are leading the charge, uh, primarily Germany and the EU, and they're uh, giving Google a fine of, uh, I don't know, what was it, $3 billion? Or, and, of course, Google's fighting it because they can afford to fight it. And... The Federal Trade Commission is about to announce a fine for Facebook of three to five billion dollars. So it's a winner-take-all monopoly capitalism, and it's time to change the game. Do you have a question? Like, is it? Yes. Would the Wall time? Street yeah. Journal like to respond to "It's time to change the game"? Um, Francesco, uh, I, I won't comment on that. I mean, I'm I'm focused on. Um, other areas of, of um, operation, it's not really my domain. But you wrote about it. Yes, I mean, I think yes. <laughs> I think yes, I'm well publicized as saying I, 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 I know so many people, many of whom I've worked with before, in all of the journalistic operations, in all of the platforms. I couldn't respect them more. I think they've got a difficult job to do. Doesn't matter who the people are, they're too big. They have too much power, there is too much money. We don't know enough about them as researchers we have no insight into what they are doing or what's on their platforms unless they allow it to us. And our, our, our researchers have just seen less and less and less access via APIs. So if you're a publisher, if you're a researcher, if you're an ordinary citizen, you want to know what's going on in terms of this massive change in the communications technology, there is almost no way to find out unless the companies tell you. So going back to that, that question, though, the question earlier, right? Yeah. Um, the fear question of, of the dominance. Is government regulation the only way to do anything about it, you think? I am a European, so my answer would be yes. <laughs> so, is it, well, you know, there has to be higher power. I mean, this is, a, this is a super interesting moment, I think, for us, and maybe next year when we gather to discuss this. I personally think civic media and public media will be a much higher on the agenda because we have, we've just, it seems to me that in certain markets, and the US is one, we've decided not to have public media. We're just outsourcing things to philanthropic organizations and large tech platforms. And it's a time when we should be having that as a civic debate rather than a time when we should be just letting companies uh, and governments sort of necessarily sort of decide. I don't know. I, I'm just the chair here, so I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be saying this, but as the person who is not, I'm, I, I don't mind. I know that Francesca is in a difficult position here, so I don't mind having, I don't mind having that role of saying I think that regulation is the right, the right way to go. <laughs> and the New York yeah. Times has just launched that philanthropic yeah. effort, yeah. looking for partners, right, in the philanthropic right. Right, right. But I'll let Latoya. You've seen our, our, our CEO give a comment on this. It, a company this size and which, with this much success, we acknowledge that the scrutiny is there and, and, and don't try to escape it. Right. 
I thought, you know, I would say, I would say in terms of both Facebook and Google, you do see, a, and Apple, you see a change in attitude, which goes, it's not never regulation, it's like, what's the right regulation? My worry is that they all have much more money to uh, engage with lawmakers than publishers do. So it's that, I think your CEO problem. just said that on CNN, actually, yeah. dot com. Oh, on so CNN, you yes, which out. you can actually get on your mobile phone, <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but um, uh, I'm going to come down here and then to the back again, so can you, thanks, and I'm Steve Ross, I taught here for 20 years full time and before that as an adjunct. Latoya and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, let me use the fetal heartbeat uh, uh, okay. kerfuffle as an example. Uh, when the fetal heartbeat bills started uh, being proposed and passed, um, the, uh, you go on Google, uh, you do a search, and all but two of the uh, organizations that you get in the first three pages talk about this fetal heartbeat. Uh, at six weeks, the fetus is the size of a grain of rice. It has no heart, it has no brain, it has no blood. Uh, uh, most of the scientific sites would say 17 weeks or 18 weeks before you get a heartbeat. Yet CNN, Google, all of you, uh, all of your organizations, uh, until just a couple of weeks ago, after the damage had already been done, uh, didn't catch up with that little fact. So it was just that that was beating it ahead. Uh, the same thing with illegal immigrants. It's perfectly legal to cross a border, turn yourself in, and ask for asylum. They're not illegal immigrants, they're asylum seekers, and there's nothing illegal about it. And you can go on and on and on this way. The aggregators and the news organizations that depend on the aggregators for their leads, and the reporters themselves that depend on that, um, are falling victim to very, very well-established front organizations, if you will. Uh, you would ha your algorithms can't possibly go deep enough to investigate the sources of all this, of all this fake news. And it's on both sides, I, the classic example uh, was Rick Santorum <laughs> years ago. And Google hasn't caught up with it yet, Yahoo hasn't caught up with it yet, Bing hasn't caught up with it yet, CNN certainly hasn't co caught up with it yet. Um, what can you do, if anything, and if you can't do anything, what can you do to warn people, especially other reporters doing research, that you can't do anything? It's just not possible. That's a great question. It touches on lots of things about like where do we balance freedom of speech versus information security and you know for what, what is fake news, not fake news, etc. I mean, it is a curatorial editorial problem, and I, just to respond uh, there to uh, Steve's mm -hmm. question would be really super interesting. Uh, Katia, do you want to? Uh, and yeah, to the point from an aggregation perspective, um, we're not using. We're people behind it, behind the front page. I'm just gonna put that out there. I, my, my front page editor sits right next to me and I see him does, deciding how the headlines will go up, who it's coming from and how they go out. And it's, it's a couple of editors actually, several editors who work on that together. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand to the point of, of where we get news and how we push it out. Is that the concern here? Well, I think it's also about language. Yeah, so, so it is about, yeah. it's, there's, a, there's a battle for language. There's a political battle for language. Yeah. Um, and it comes down to it's often editorial choices that we make. Um, you know, I worked with The Guardian for a very long time. We used to kind of wring our hands about the use of the word terrorist, which we <laughs> almost never used in any of our coverage. But if you didn't use the word terrorist, nobody would find what you were writing on Google. So we'd have this absurd thing where we would have to tag everything with alternate words that for political reasons we wouldn't necessarily put in a piece. I mean, it feels as though this kind of the free speech ethos of Silicon Valley is having to give over to more of a kind of cultural conversation about language. Is that, it, um, is But doesn't sound even right, deeper than that? Yeah. No, it, it, that's a good example, yeah. by the way. It, it, yeah. Even the Israelis used years ago, when yeah. the Palestinian attacked a military person in uniform, that wasn't terrorism, that was a military act. Right. If they attacked a school bus, that was yeah. terrorism. Right. That's gone out of the language. Right. I think, it's, I think it's deeper than the tech, though, because this was even before we had the aggregating. Yeah, this is, 
you know, and, 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 and you, you just educated me on the fetal heartbeat issue because, I mean, I, I, Grant, I haven't delved deeply into it, but I, I was unaware of that. I mean, the illegal immigrant thing, I know really well because when I was an editor at the New York Times, Julia Preston, who was the dean of, you know, immigration reports, and I had a, a huge fight over illegal immigration. She's like, well, no, 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 it's not illegal because this statute and this civil crime. I'm like, all right, that's what you think, girl, but like normal people are like, illegal immigrant, they ain't supposed to be here. So we have to work hard as journalists to do that work. And it's not gonna always translate, especially in the digital age, won't always translate in you know, a quick mobile headline. And we have to do the work. But it comes down to really core journalism to me. Yeah, yeah I think there are two solutions you know, from different perspectives. So on the technology aggregator slash platform, I think one approach is to show the same results from different perspectives. And this is something that um, you know, more sophisticated news consumers will proactively do. They'll go to Fox News and then they'll go you know, somewhere else uh, on, um, on the spectrum, political spectrum. On the, um, on the journalistic side, the publishers that do use these algorithms to surface content on, top, uh, on, on their front pages, um, it, at the journal we call these, these systems editorial alg algorithms, and as such, they should be monitored by an individual. So there's, there's a layer of human decision making there. Can I say one, quick, yeah, one, sure. one quick thing? Um, it, it, no escaping that these are difficult and complex issues and sometimes we're behind them and it takes a little bit of time to catch up to them. Hopefully we get there sooner than later. But the question or, or, or maybe the comment you were alluding to about what the platforms can do, I don't, I don't know if I underscored this enough, a lot of what we do is in collaboration, we form something called the Trust Project, which is meant to, to give indicators and signals of what's trustworthy uh, versus what's less trustworthy. So uh, again, it takes some time for us to catch up to these things, but we are really thinking about what are the signals that we can send to a person to make sure that you are doing your due diligence and you are really, I guess, interrogating the, the, the information that you see and making sure it's something that's right for you, something that's valid. Do you, do, it, are all the, the efforts that we saw post-2016 in fact-checking, the Trust Project is a really great example of that. We you know, talk to and, and do similar res sort of research around some of these markers. Is any of it actually working? I think it is, and I, I saw Claire in the back of the room who we've done a lot of work with First Draft around, and I, I would say it is working because we take those things and we, and, and we, we try to execute at different mom moments in time. A lot of our teams around elections in particular, uh, we did something in 2016 called Election Land where we pulled together um, a, a group of journalists, I think it was over a thousand journalists on election day to really uh, attack misinformation about voting poll or polling locations. We did the same thing in the French elections, in the Brazilian elections. Elections. So we can take these things and, and really bring people together in different markets to make sure that we are understanding mis and disinformation as it relates to a particular moment in time. So there's a lot of work to be yeah. done, but we are accelerating and not decelerating. Because I, I just wonder if we're ever going to catch up. So Election Land was a great initiative and some really fantastic things came out of it. But it also said, well, you know, pretty much there was no disinformation or like we kind of managed to nail it. And then like three days later, it was like actually the entire <laughs> election was subject to a huge disinformation campaign that it just came from a completely different source that you weren't looking at, you know, that, that, we, that, that reporters, a few reporters were looking at, but that was just so hard to detect and parse out. So is that, is that a worry as well when you go and you give kind of clean bills of health to information? that it always, there's always another threat. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the worry is that it, things change so quickly that we often find ourselves behind it and not ahead of it. Getting to the point where we are ahead of it certainly is a worry. And it's what you see us continuing to iterate and continuing to not let this work die. But, it, but, but, but you know, just back to the original question, you know, that would mean perhaps uh, just downranking all headlines that had fetal heartbeat in when they were talking about kind of uh, early stage abortions. Um, that's not something that Google is prepared, prepared to do. Is that right? No, that's not something that we, we do. Okay, but yet that is feeding a kind of a, a misinformation. And, and I totally understand that right. point of view. So, okay, we'll return to that later next year. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna come here and then there, yeah. All right. and, then we, and then we were a little bit late starting, so we're gonna be um, a tiny bit late finishing, but then these last two questions. Hi, um, thanks everybody, this has been great. This, um, I'm Eric Carvin from the Associated Press. And the concern I have is I, I love the idea of, uh, Marcus, you were talking about more education for the public, ways to help people better understand what is and isn't reliable, uh, uh, accurate content, and also brands, and also developing relationships with the audience. Uh, the concern I have is how do you do that work and make sure it actually gets to the people who are actually 
most vulnerable to being misinformed. Because I worry sometimes that we're just taking the people who are like, do trust news organizations, and they just decide to finally, okay, I'll subscribe. I've always liked you. And, then they, they, and, you, and you convert them, and that's good from a business perspective. Or you take the people who, you know, they know which news organizations they can trust, and oh, now they have a better idea of where the news is coming from. But it, how do you bridge that gap and make sure that the actual risk of being misinformed is reduced on sort of a, a population level? I think that's a great question. We, we struggle with it all the time around kind of engagement, how's journalism more engaging, et cetera. Does anyone have an answer to Eric's excellent question? Which is I would love for someone in this room or somewhere on this campus or some other campus uh, to, to come up with an answer for that and then for you guys to, to fund them. I mean, that's what I would love because that is, that is the gold. That, that's, that's, the, that's the golden fleece. That's it. That's it. And to uh, Marcus's point, uh, that's exactly what the, the GNI is about. We talk about um, what are the challenges and how do we partner and collaborate to, to, to really attack these issues. So again, if somebody's got the answer, you know exactly who to talk to. <laughs> or even if you're just researching what you think might be the answer, right? Yes. You come to the Tower Center where we don't take any technology money, so you'll know that we'll be completely <laughs> clean. I just want to add. I just wanted to ask Ms. Tubman, what is Yahoo today? Is it a subdivision of Altaba? Is it a subdivision of one of Jack Ma's corporations? What exactly is Yahoo today? Uh, it's, did you want Go to ahead. No, 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 I was going to say, say, this is why I love doing things in the journalism <laughs> school. The audience always have better questions than I have. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's still an aggregator, uh, but it's shifted significantly, as I said earlier, to original content news. And so really it's the, the news for the person in the middle. Um, and when I say that is that our population of the, our audience is what we consider politically centrist and geographically centrist. Uh, they are not on the coast. They are suburban, rural folks. A majority of them are over the age of 50 and they're white males. Um, and we're trying to diversify, as I'm sure a lot of newsrooms are, um, to get younger and younger audiences. But right now, that's our audience. Our audience can lean, literally, if they're in the middle, they can easily lean one way or the other. But the best part is that they come to us looking for us to be in the middle. Just, just, just to push on the question a tiny, yeah. yeah. But, oh, but, okay, so, so on ownership, but also just to pu push on the question a little, take it a tiny bit further, because I think it's a good place to leave it as well, which is just that definition of a news organization. So yeah. it's really clear that CNN is a news organization. It's really clear that w the Wall Street Journal is a news organization. It's becoming much less clear about whether or not Google is a news organization. Or if, and yeah, are you exactly. like part of, like, how do you, how do you? We are a news organization and we see ourselves as a news organization within a corporation. So internally, we call ourselves a brand, just as a, our you know, downstairs HuffPo would call themselves a brand, but within ourselves, we are a news organization. Most of the people who come to us don't even know that we're owned by Verizon um, and that we sit on the same, you know, level as Tumblr and other um, brands that this company owns. But internally, we run as a news organization and we're totally separate from the business. It's only really our business leaders who are in, like, touching and going with us. In, in every out of in, in every project we have, if there is a business aspect that needs to be touched upon and to be boosted by the fact that we are owned by Verizon, a mobile company, um, that will come into play. But for the most part, we are our own unit. Latoya, are you a news organization? We are a technology company. <laughs> they are not a news organization. We're going to come back and litigate that platform. one again uh, <laughs> next year. I'm really sorry. I've allowed this panel to go on way too long because actually it's not too long, uh, just the right amount of time uh, because you had great questions. But also, that was a fantastic discussion. Um, it was fantastic research. Thank you very much indeed. And I just want to say thank you very much indeed to Katie Johnston, who's our program uh, director, who arranged literally everything this morning, um, and uh, the team at Tau here. Uh, and we hope that you'll all come back because... Uh